thank you for your patience on that. We had one more vote that had been anticipated, uh, and so it took a little bit longer, but we were happy that you're all back with us and ready to start asking some questions, which I'll kick off uh, for five minutes, because I want to ask something about the, the basic premise of this whole operation here. We, everybody seems to be testifying on the notion that we've accepted the premise that private contracting and subcontracting is here to stay on contingency operations. Yet every one of you cites numerous problems with oversight, with management and personnel, the integration into planning, the command structure, legal issues, liability, responsibility, uh, control over individuals uh, for whom we're going to get the blame, whatever they do, even though they may not be technically in our Department of Defense or our State Department or USAID. So given all of those difficulties uh, and separating out the State and USAID part of it right now, but starting with the Department of Defense, why aren't we giving more consideration to the notion of not having contractors and subcontractors in our military operations uh, where well, we already have established clear lines of responsibility for those in the military, clear lines of management, clear lines of uh, accountability, uh, and, and all of that. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, if we just define military operation, uh, operations as inherently governmental because they're military operations in the name of the United States and under our flag overseas, that that would remedy a lot of these problems. Mr. Solis? I'll, I'll take a first stab at it. I think what we've tried to say is that we're, we're not saying that contractors should be used one way or the other. I think we've tried to say is that from what we understand from the department uh, in military operations that it's likely that they are going to be part of it. So we're not saying that they are. That being said, going back to what I mentioned in our statement, is that there needs to be a fundamental look at the requirements for contracting if, in fact, you want to do contracting. I don't think we're trying to say that you will use contracting, but if that's what you are going to do in terms of your military operations, you have to plan that up front. You have to look and say, are we going to contract for certain things, not just on the logistical side, that we are using contractors on the intel side and, and, and network operations and a number of other things. We are using them as linguists. Uh, everywhere I go, you know, military members say, I think we've gone too far. But I think there needs to be this fundamental look, see, at the beginning to say whether or not we are going to use them, and if we are going to use them, then we need to put the proper oversight and controls in place. I, I certainly would agree with you there. I, I'll tell you something. You know, when I look at all of you talking about being on top of this issue since the 1990s, and advising you know everybody to to start looking at these contracts uh, and moving forward or whatever like that, and basically, so large part just being blown off. I mean, here we are, you know, 20 years later, and you've got a little bit of compliance with some of the recommendations and a whole lot of non-compliance and sometimes inattention uh, to them. So, uh, Miss Yugan. Yeah, I think the whole issue, and I think my colleagues here have raised it, is the inherently governmental function issue, which is, I believe, OMB has proposed uh, policy definitions of that. Um, the issue is um, how closely related is it to the inherently government of function and sh should these critical capabilities be insourced? I believe there was legislation passed in the last couple of years that requires the military departments to take a look at their ca uh, contracted out capabilities to see whether or not any of them should actually be insourced, which is brought back in-house. And that's one way in which the department can analyze that particular situation. I think there's already legislation out there that there allows. Is, uh, legislation is there, the compliance isn't, and that's, and that's the problem. And, and again, the question goes back to when did war ever become something that wasn't inherently, inherently governmental uh, in all the things that go with it on that? When I see recommendations here of, you know, trying to uh, incorporate in and integrate into uh, the command chain contractors so that they're more involved in the planning and the operation and like that, I say, well, if you're going to do that, you might as well have them be on your payroll. Mr. Bowen. Well, Mr. Chairman, you say, when did that happen? I think the time is the late 1980s, when exactly. LogCap 1 was created. And, and essentially the support, um, fuel, food, billeting of troops in the field uh, was outsourced. And we've spent now on LogCap in, uh, in Iraq in excess of $35 billion, uh, in, in that, in, in, in that in those three areas. Uh, the it's, it's been an incrementalism since the since the late 1980s. What can be covered is a continuing question in every conflict, and 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 the answer is always a little bit more. Has anybody ever looked at you know what is it that we did in World War II? What is it that we did in the Korean conflict? Uh, 
in terms of that, Mr. Fontaine, it, 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 what a segue, huh? Yeah, yeah exactly. In our uh, report, actually, we have a historical section that looks back, actually, all the way to George Washington. Uh, and contractors, in some way, shape, or form, have played a role in all of our conflicts going back that far. There were, you know, thousands of, uh, of contractors working in, uh, in Vietnam and Korea. The big change, though, has been what they've done and the dependence that the United States has had upon what they've done. So in Vietnam, for example, you had a large number of contractors working on construction projects in Vietnam. And that obviously is less controversial uh, in terms of what contractors do. Uh, you know, now we, in, in the current wars, we've had contractors doing interrogation, private security operations, uh, weight, weapons maintenance, uh, according to reports, even uh, you know maintaining drone operations, those sort of things, which are much more controversial. So I think that's the big change that's happened over the years: is the scope of activities that contractors have begun to carry out, and because we have you know upwards of 200,000 contractors now in Iraq and Afghanistan, if you pulled those out of the operation or tried to federalize them all, it'd be very difficult to do so. Yeah, I wonder how easy it would be to keep voting to be over there involved in these conflicts if it was 200,000. Uh, people, the United States citizens in combat, as opposed to you know ninety odd thousand in one place with uh, one hundred and ten thousand contractors, sort of off the books. Well, this is another the political consideration, right? I mean, I think this is another aspect of it: is the the political cost uh, goes down to the, the degree that contracting support goes up because you know we. We always mourn the losses of American service people who are killed. They're on the faces of the fallen tributes and everything else. But contractors die and are hurt, um, and they barely register. Uh, so there's a reduction in the political cost of these operations. But I think at the same time, unless uh, the United States has a very significant reduction in its international commitments, which personally I think is relatively unlikely, at least in the near to, mid to midterm, then we will probably continue to rely with our current force structure on contractors to do the work that our military is not big enough to carry out on its own. Thank you. Mr. Flake. Let me just follow on with that theme, if I could. And Mr. Boeing, Mr. Fontaine first. Um, we, the report that was issued uh, with regard to uh, the Warlord Inc., um, this is one, and it was mentioned before by Mr. Solis, that uh, you take into account both efficiency and whether or not it it uh, aids our policy, our overall policy goals. This is one where when you have local contractors with the trucking contract, it's, it's I think, undoubtedly the most efficient way to move, move goods between military bases in Afghanistan. But when we find out that a significant portion of the money that's, uh, that uh, is used to pay those contracts is going for protection money to some very unsavory characters, some of whom uh, very tight with the Taliban or, or, or contracting with the Taliban for this protection. That certainly runs counter to our policy, uh, our counterinsurgency policy, which calls for one source of authority, that being the Afghan government, and no parallel uh, authority structures there that we're, in this case, not only tolerating, we're building up uh, these militias uh, and warlords and whatnot. What, how do we reconcile that? It, it kind of goes back to what the chairman was talking about and where, you know, the, the political cost. Certainly, if we, if we did what the Soviets did, use their force structure to guard the supply lines, uh, according to this report, it was 75 percent of their force structure. That would require, you know, a doubling of our number of troops. And it wouldn't be very efficient, and we'd have certainly more casualties. Uh, but it may be the only way to run a, an effective counterinsurgency policy as we've defined it. Uh, how, how do we reconcile that, or can we reconcile that? Um, Mr. Bowen, you want to give it a shot? Well, the, the issue, uh, the policy issue, I guess, is using financial resources to, per, to pacify a region, and, 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 and it was certainly expedient in, in your, uh, an expedient process, uh, ad hoc, uh, it, with respect to uh, the, the, the keeping the trucking routes safe. In, in Iraq, much more complicated, more, much more thought through process, the Anbar Awakening, the, the Sons of Iraq program, spent in excess of $450 million of Commander's Emergency Response Program money to pacify Anbar province uh, and, and regional areas. Um, similar policy issues, different approaches to how well thought out, how well structured those, the execution of the two programs was. Uh, in Afghanistan, the policy execution was essentially expedient and almost outsourced, as you point out. In Iraq, it was 
It was carefully thought through, as was the transition of the main maintenance of that pacification program, now borne financially by the Iraqi government. Mr. Fontaine, do you have any thoughts on that? From that, you know, the 35,000 foot level, how does this look in terms of the use of contractors in this trucking contract? Well, obviously, uh, in any war, uh, funneling money to your enemy uh, is not a good idea. So I think you should start from that premise. Um, I do think that at some point there may need to be a fundamental choice made um, whether to uh, proceed, whether the effects are mitigated uh, through more oversight and that kind of thing, uh, to proceed in a fashion where we are willing to trade money in order to have a pacified area through which our supply lines can travel, knowing that some of that money will go to our enemy, or whether we're willing to tolerate the potential of more casualties and more disruption of our supply lines. I think that that's probably a fundamental choice. Uh, but when it comes to counterinsurgency, I think that uh, not only do they have all the problems that you just described when it comes to aiding our enemies, reducing government legitimacy, uh, giving them more opportunity to attack rather than to not attack, but I also think there's a strategic communications issue to this. We're supposed to be on the side of the good guys. Uh, and so as word gets out uh, that uh, we are sort of willingly or knowingly uh, providing money that ends up in the hands of the Taliban, I wonder if uh, that pr promotes a sense that the United States is not in this sort of for the long term in order to actually see the government succeed rather than trying to go with short-term expediency. Thank you. Ms. Yugon, I have just a moment left. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there are provisions if there's no value added uh, from the, having the prime contract or, or the subcontractors that uh, we have the authority to pull back some of the funds uh, used for that. How often is that utilized? Um, we haven't done work in the area on the pass-through. That was legislation that was enacted, I think, in FY 2007. But one of the things that it, w it focuses on is the subcontractor level. We do plan to do some work based on the contingency contracting framework for reform. We've identified where primes have had problems. Well, we plan to take a look at the primes that are primarily IDIQ contracts, and we're going to go down to the sub-level to see if there is issues, are issues related to pass-through, as well as other issues related to uh, subcontractor responsibility let as well. Ask, let me just ask it another way quickly. Um, you're not aware of any instance where we've actually pulled back funds? No. We have, I, I'm not aware of any instance about recovering excess costs. Thank you. Ms. Chu, you recognize five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, last week we found out that in the course of investigating the host nation trucking contract that uh, military logist uh, logisticians were relying on reports from prime contractors to gain visibility into the subcontractors that were actually driving the trucks and providing security for the convoys. And there was strong evidence that uh, these subcontractors were, were paying off the Taliban. Um, this is a very distressing situation, and uh, what I'd like to ask the panelists is, in general, what areas of oversight are appropriate for DOD to leave up to the prime contractor, and what areas should DOD take a more direct role in overseeing, and in doing so, how could we prevent this uh, corruption from occurring? You know, I think, um, and uh, one of the things in, pre in preparing for this hearing it became a, quite apparent that the federal acquisition regulation has not kept up with subcontract management. We just took one contract out of here, an IDIQ contract, with I believe it was five prime contractors, and there are 200 subcontractors under that prime. If you take a look at the federal acquisition regulation, there are provisions but as far as subcontract management, I don't think it's kept up with the level of sub subcontractor performance that's required under these primes. So I think there needs to be a look at the Federal Acquisition Regulation with respect to subcontract management. Are there not guidelines for this? There are, and um, there is, and I talked about a little bit in my, um, in my opening statement, there's the consent to subcontract, which is if the contracting officer requires uh, a, a prime uh, to provide uh, information on their subs, 
in order for the contracting officer to consent to subcontract, then there is some insight into subcontractor responsibility. But if the contracting officer does not require that, then you're not going to have the insight. And uh, the provisions in the current FAR allows a lot of leeway to the contracting officer. And, and what would change it so that you could have this more stringent oversight of the subcontractor? Excuse me, I, I didn't quite hear the question. What what could, where would it, uh, what would it take to change it so that you could have this? Well, one of the things is I think the provisions, let me just take the situation with the warlord situation. Um, the contracting officer can, under the current provisions of the FAR, designate um, subcontracts in that situation is something that requires special surveillance or special uh, oversight. It does allow in the, um, in the FAR to do that. For example, you could say to the prime, I need to be able to consent to you con subcontracting with these primes. I need to get insight into your subcontractors. I can also establish perhaps a special surveillance program for those particular subcontractors. So there are some provisions, but it's up to the contracting officer uh, to determine whether or not those provisions are invoked. And it, there are some other additional requirements that have to do with a contractor purchasing system, and it gets a little bit more detailed as to when you have to get um, a consent to subcontract from the contracting officer. Uh, Ms. I want to ask another question about the culture at the Department of Defense. And uh, Mr. Solis, you talked about um, the fact that the contracting reform at DOD is hampered by the department's inability to institutionalize operational contract support by accepting contractors as an integral part of the total force. But I also note that um, you have you had had several recommendations, but the DOD has been slow to implement um, ha has been slow to implement uh, many of the recommendations. What could change this culture? I, I think one of the things, again, and I think the joint staff, and I think this was alluded to at the hearing last week, there was a joint staff study to look at the reliance on contractors in Iraq. And I think that, again, begins the process of looking how reliant that, that DOD is, not only for Iraq, but for future operations in terms of the reliance. I think also, as I mentioned in the testimony here, when you look for future operations, there are requirements to look for there are requirements in, uh, to produce what was called an Annex W, which looks at uh, contractor requirements for new operations or future operations. That has got to be done. That has got to be done very rigorously and, and on time. And I think unless, we, unless the department does, does that kind of thing, we're going to be in the same situation talking about another contract the next time. I, I think um, the only other thing I would offer is that I know in the, in the current version of the defense authorization bill that the Senate just put passed, that they made some changes to the uh, requirements for looking at contractor requirements uh, in, in the defense bill. And that's going to be part of the QDR, uh, at least as, as envisioned now. So it's going to bring that strategic look up, up to it at that point. I still think there are ba some basic problems in terms of, again, as I mentioned, lessons learned, uh, you know, background screenings. Uh, I think those things are on, we're on record with some of the recommendations to make changes to that. For whatever reason, the department for, has, has not acted upon all, all those in a timely manner. We're still trying to pursue some of those. But again, I think the fundamental piece is that you've got to look at your reliance on contractors before you start making other adjustments. Thank you. Yield back. Mr. Duncan, you recognize for five minutes. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having and holding another hearing and trying to call attention to uh, all the problems, all the waste, fraud, and abuse, the one scandal after another that's uh, gone on through these <clears throat> many years that uh, we've been in Iraq and Afghanistan. Throughout uh, all this time, uh, we've had uh, more contractors and subcontractors than we've had um, uh, soldiers um, in these areas. I heard Mr. Fontaine say a moment ago that uh, the use of contractors by the um, military has gone on since uh, the founding of the country, but uh, I can tell you there's uh, 
uh, never been the um, uh, ridiculous markups, the excessive, almost obscene profiteering. The, uh, there's never been the ripoffs of the, uh, of the taxpayers that have gone on to the extent that they have gone on in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, these wars have always been more about, um, far more about money than they have been about any real threat to this uh, nation. It's uh, it, it's really um, uh, shameful, and it's and it's very very sad um, what has gone on, and that's. Uh, um, there, there's really no real way to correct it. When, when you have a private uh, uh, companies dealing with each other, things are done at a, at a, fo a fourth or a third or half of the cost that you have when you have the federal government involved uh, dealing with contractors in the Department of Defense. Uh, because of the uh, lobbying influence of retired admirals and generals has uh, has been the worst uh, uh, um, and the most expensive of any of the federal contractor uh, contracting that's gone on by our government. Uh, but that's that's really all I have to say. I thank you very much for giving me this time. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Mr. Lynch, you're recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Bowen, good to see you again. 